Okay, good morning. Good to have all of you here into the 11th week of our course. Uh, thank you for joining in week after week. Welcome to the e-learning students as well for your uh, diligence, for staying through the course. Um, we are at the last uh, couple of weeks, just four more weeks to go, and we'll be ending our uh, semester. I hope it's been fruitful, it's been helpful for you. So the last week, uh, we started on um, specific issues of counseling. We uh, focused on uh, mental health and marriage and family the last week. And today, we'll be looking at uh, abuse, different kinds of abuse. Now, the topic in itself is extremely vast. It's, um, it's big, um, and there are so many kinds of uh, conditions even through when we're looking at abuse. So we may not really go into much of details of it. However, we try and see um, as best as how we can form an understanding of it. Uh, so the, the objectives of this, maybe the class more is to help us um, be able to recognize signs of abuse that happens in the lives of people as well as as well as preliminary things that we as ministers can do to uh, work alongside those who are being abused or those who are abusers. Um, so it, it may be not a complete detailed step-by-step um, uh, -step process that we're going to be taking through. So they may be put in quite general. Um, and uh, it, it will require a lot more of in-depth study, in-depth training to work with those who are abused. So this is just uh, an overview. Please see this only as an overview of what we need to be aware of. Um, how do we recognize symptoms? How do we recognize people who may be going through these forms of abuse? And what could we as ministers do on a uh, on, on a basic level to help and support those who are who may be in this category okay so if you if you are to just turn I'm at uh, page um, 45 in in the course notes and um, um, you know I, I don't have a PPT here uh, there's more of a more of um, I think a lot more of discussion that I will bring up I could also put in some kind of a reading material in the uh, in the course notes in the sorry in the stream as well as uh, as help for the e-learning students so that if you are uh, interested you could actually read a little bit more apart from the two hours that we have in class okay so uh, so to get started let's uh, uh, let's let's look at a few of of the of first and foremost uh, look at what do we understand by abuse okay uh, abuse is is anything that um, so if you look at the word abuse it is um, when something is given to you for your use you do not use it in its proper form and you um, misuse it misuse it to uh, to a point where it causes damage where it causes evil where it causes uh, definite depreciation in the life of somebody else or your own that is what we call that that's what we would term as abuse okay now abuse can be different can come in different forms it can be physical it can be emotional it can be verbal and uh, it can be sexual now abuse can come in not just in isolation but it can come in as a combination of one, two, uh, of two, three, maybe all of these together. Uh, another part of abuse that uh, we're also just going to briefly touch upon is neglect. Uh, it, and neglect is generally seen among the more um, um, vulnerable class of uh, people, that is maybe towards children or towards the elderly where people are th those categories of people who are not able to take care of their own needs or their own basic needs and require to be dependent 
on a caretaker or, or on someone like for children who are dependent on parents or guardians or elderly who are dependent on other uh, younger caretakers maybe children other family members who need uh, who need uh, who who they are dependent on so that's what we would call as neglect okay so um, let's look at um, a few of them and we may just focus on one or two um, kinds of uh, abuses in each uh, and you know we could apply that in uh, over a over a larger understanding okay um, so before we get started i think it is important for us to understand that the bible uh, uh, definitely talks against any form of uh, uh, evil that one does towards another uh, so if you look at ex uh, in leviticus um, uh, I'm just going to try and see if I remember where it is. Leviticus. Uh, sorry, in Exodus. Um, sorry, I'm just pulling that out. Exodus uh, 21. Yes, Exodus 21, where it does talk about... Um, Uh, it talks about evil, so it basically talks also about slaves, uh, about injury, about any forms of physical physical abuse, physical violence towards others in any form. I think it's also then the previous chapter or the chapter after that. I, I think I misplaced it and I can't, I'm not able to find it. But uh, I think it's largely there in uh, Exodus 21 where uh, it's all about how uh, anyone causing harm uh, towards or striking somebody, you know, striking a father or mother, uh, uh, kidnapping, cursing, uh, any kind of accidental physical violence, physical abuse is definitely something that is brought about in, in that scripture. So we do see that any kind of violation of a person's um, space physically, emotionally, sexually, uh, is something that is that that God abhors, that God uh, does not uh, desire that His children engage in. Okay, um, so when we're looking at um, uh, physical abuse, uh, what 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 are we basically dealing with? Is uh, any kind of harm, or that is that is inflicted upon somebody's body. So it can be in the form of hitting, beating, pushing, uh, shaking, biting, choking, throwing, um, uh, burning, pinching, um, all of that, right? Any kind of physical injury uh, or, or, or any kind of an inflicted injury that comes from hitting. Okay, that's what we would we would consider as uh, physical abuse, and a part of physical abuse that we do see is violence. We see as domestic violence. So, uh, um, you know, we the fact that all of this was put in scripture in itself, uh, you know, in those verses when, in that twenty one in Exodus twenty one around I think from the twelfth verse onwards. Um, it shows that the Bible does condemn uh, abuse of violence uh, of every kind. Uh, so it it not only uh, describes um, abuse and uh, you know the, you see that there there are also other kind of stories of abuse um, that uh, bring about and we 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 know that it clearly condemns um, abuse of all kinds. So abuse generally of authority or power that is abuse that comes as a result of somebody's authority over someone else or power over someone else is a sin it's not uh, a, a di uh, an acceptable dynamic in any relationship and especially not that in a marriage relationship so when you when you look at um, uh, you know, one of the verses in the Psalm, Psalms, in Psalms 11, verse 5, it says, The wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. 
okay and we do see that uh, that 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 uh, the lord that, that it's talking about the lord uh, it says he says examines the righteous but the wicked those who lo love violence he hates with a passion so you you see that god hates those um who who uh, uh, hates violence hates uh, anyone who who does uh, meet out violence uh, as a state of authority or, or as a result um, of power okay uh, so we need to recognize uh, and and if, if when we look in scripture also the fact that you know these yeah that's what i was trying to say the fact that these um, verses were highlighted in exodus and god actually brings this as an institute it probably does show that there were there must have been these kind of horrific acts that were happening in in the um, among the children of Israel, right? And he describes that that's something that it was almost, it was given as a law there that they should not engage in something like that. So we can we can probably safely guess that all of these things, uh, any form of abuse that we understand and we know of was something that also was happening even at that point, uh, that period of time, okay? So uh, it, we also see that the Bible also speaks honestly of abuse. It condemns abuse, um, those even those who practice violence, um, and it it I think so. The the crux of counseling is to help um, people who are in those abuse places to know that God hears the cry of the abused, the oppressed, the torn, the battered and the beaten and we see that in, in psalms 10 17 it says you lord hear the desire of the afflicted you encourage them you listen to their cry so the we, we see that god definitely is not deaf to the ears of those who are abused okay uh, and and we see that god is the one who understands it and when you look at isaiah uh, 53 5 it says he was despised and rejected by a man by by men uh, he was a man who was familiar with that kind of suffering so it's god himself jesus himself understood what it really means to be afflicted and oppressed okay so um when we're looking at uh, um, um abuse uh, and, and so when i look at domestic violence i'm looking at it of course within within the marriage in itself right so it's a it is important that all forms of abuse must be addressed and taken seriously by any of us who are ministering to those who are uh, coming to us for help right so it's it's not something that can be minimized uh, away right so when an abuse uh, takes place in a marriage uh, it is important to ensure that that comes to an end the abuse comes to an end and this is the point of time when individual or separate counseling for the abused and the abuser is necessary it, it's really important to identify the presence of abuse in marriage because if it if it goes undetected what can happen is that these um, patterns can can definitely affect uh, the relationship affect children uh, uh, and and later also affect if uh, affect the way the process of counseling could also go okay so one of the important fundamentals of counseling is helping uh, couples examine their own behavior so that they each understand um, their contribution to maybe a problem that's that's shared but uh, but uh, you know you if there is um, a violence in it uh, you need to form uh, to to come to a place of bringing them to uh, bringing it to an end in whatever means and we'll discuss some of that as we go by right so when when counseling husbands who are abuse abusive uh, it must be absolutely clear that uh, the headship biblical headship does not entitle a husband to treat their wives in a violent or an oppressive ma uh, manner so in, in you know and in, in the core of most uh, domestic abuse is that is the use of a husband uh, is the use of a husband's leadership to exercise control over another individual 
and we see that biblical headship as is as described in scripture it's a sacrificial servanthood it's not um uh, it's not unlimited uh, authority right it's a sacrificial uh, servanthood so we 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 need to be careful to uh, help the husband see that when a husband demands his own way or dominates his wife we do not call this as biblical headship we call it um, an abuse of the power that they have okay now it it can happen i in both ways like a husband abusing a wife uh, and and also the other way, wife abusing uh, a husband so in the light of this what are some of the things that we may need to do i think there are important uh, uh, two important things that we may need to focus on is first and foremost is to identify what the immediate needs are okay <clears throat> and second is to plan for uh, long term care so when you're identifying what is most immediate the first need is in any uh, violent situation domestic violent situation is to prioritize the safety of the person who is being uh, abused okay and often this is primarily just a matter of physical safety making sure that they are in a physical space where the, where it is safe uh, without being um in, in uh, being confronting the abuse over and over again so as um as a person who is there as a minister or as a person to help the first priority is to ensure that they get the physical safety that they need okay um so uh, it it, it sh and and i think it is important also depending on what but the kind of abuse has been it's also to ensure to be able to uh, uh whatever is needed to take it into into a legal or a law enforcement right because if there is significant violence multiple violence so much so that there's there's probably leading to death and uh, leading to significant injuries um multiple hospitalizations all of that you know maybe a legal uh, route also probably could be needed but again that's something that you that that you see how you take that forward uh, some of the times um it, even i mean i again even as i'm saying this i'm not condoning that uh, you know it's okay it's the fact that uh, when when you're looking at the kind of abuse the extent of abuse what is it that is absolutely required so the, like i said the first and foremost thing is safety so if the um, uh, abu abused abused needs to be moved away and you know get to a safer place that's something that is what is absolutely important now what you're also doing is to assess the situation to differentiate uh, abuse from everyday relational conflict so sometimes uh, you know as as a result of conflict there may be certain kinds of abuse that may that that could happen right but i think there is something that we need to understand there are num uh, there are number of issues that can really help us understand the difference between what it is abuse <coughs> and what we call as everyday conflict so one is to see if the uh, abuser is willfully using these tactics to get what they want now they being very intentional that it becomes um, uh, uh, violence gets resorted to so that they get what they want the the spouse gets what they want okay or sometimes they steadily increase their abusive behavior to get what they want so initially it may have just been shouting and then it must be threatening and then it's like uh, you know mild pushing and then the mild pushing goes into um uh, to some kind of uh, hitting and then that goes into stronger ones and then you know so is it is it is it methodically it is is it increasing are those abusive behaviors increasing <clears throat> and the next you would see is next what you would look for is is it a series of isolated events or is there a pattern of behavior that's designed to inflict harm on an individual so is it something that's here and there very isolated or is it there is a huge pattern that you see where there is significant inflict 
okay uh, the next thing that you would look for is what are the common tactics that are used uh, by the abuser is there shaming is there exploitation is there threats is there intimidation is there uh, significant pity that they're showing and that becomes like a tactic okay? then the power they use they often the abuser can use certain power now this power can be physical it can be emotional it can be uh, even even monetary power right financial power in order to get control over their uh, uh, their uh, uh, spouse um, so that so in, in order not to give out what is what is required so what kind of power do they use next is excuse me just give me a minute okay the next is um control um uh, so what how how do these abusers uh keep their spouses under control you know sometimes abusers want their spouses to be under their control so it's some sometimes they do not permit them to meet with others to be in touch with family members uh, to keep them controlled financially maybe even even spiritually not allow them to uh, to probably go to church or or to or to meet with other people so there is a control that is exercised you know so whatever by whatever means that's necessary they would want them to be under under their control next is the uh, the abuser uh, wants what what they want you know so there may be certain needs or concerns uh, that are that are discounted at the expense of what they desire so that sometimes also becomes a, a characteristic or an aspect that you look look for so you you need to understand uh, that you know abuse generally escalates it 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 moves from one part one to another so there may be sometimes um, that the abuser recedes but then uh, when you're looking at it at the, at, the, at the entire balance, the abuse generally tends to escalate and intensify um, if there isn't any kind of help or support or intervention that's given. So make sure, um, you know, uh, when when someone when a person comes in with this with a complaint or or with this uh, issue, that you do not send back send them back to an environment that is unprepared like um so it, it needs to be very carefully planned because um if if, uh, if someone's reaching out to you and you've asked them to go back uh, to the entire situation and the abuser knows that the abused has actually shared content of abuse with someone else it can actually further escalate okay the second thing is to plan for a long-term care now that's a that's the next priority. Now, where when there is physical uh, safety, which is a concern, the se physical separation is definitely advised. Okay. However, you, you in uh, encouraging uh, the the abused um, partner when you encourage the abused partner to separate from their uh, abusive spouse, it's it's something that 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 should be done also carefully and and i think as uh, ministers or as church leaders we need to act carefully okay um we we should when we tend to act too quickly you know when we question or confront the abuser um before maybe the uh, uh, uh the victim or the or the the, the abused spouse is ready then it can often cause more harm and sometimes it can even put them to danger okay like because they could be silenced and they could be even punished by the abuser uh, who now knows that they have spoken to an outsider so it is important first and foremost to ensure that immediate safety is essential um uh, but it's also important that you're looking at something that is also long term. OK, so we need to, um, uh, at, at this point of time, remember, it's not the time to deliver a, an argument about divorce and remarriage. And all of that can probably come to a later point of time. The immediate need at this point is to ensure that there is care and support of the abuse. The plan for a long term can come always uh, 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 later. So I, I think often that I've, I've heard people 
you know, especially when um, when there are believers who are in abusive relationships who, who've come for counseling, give me a history about what they've been told by well-meaning believers, you know. It, they, they tell, you know, God calls us to endure suffering. Uh, you know, he can redeem you through suffering and hardship. That's true. All of that's true. But, you know, these principles must be balanced and uh, must be, it, it's something that everyone in a relationship uh, should adhere to. Okay. So uh, it is important to not encourage uh, people to go back to an environment um, uh, because we feel that uh, you know that, that that the entire marriage should be protected. Yes, but at this point of time, when there is this kind of a violence, the safety is first and foremost needed. We look back later into what how how we can work through that. Okay. Um, so what do you what what can you do as a long term thing? You ask questions to the uh, to the to the abused um, um, abused and maybe the abuser uh, as and when time uh, is is there as and when time goes by okay to help you gain a better perspective and understanding of the situation so at, at some t at this point there could be some people who might be fearful of retribution from the abuser or feel that they are betraying their their spouse by actually answering such questions. And that's where we help the abused understand that sharing their story is not a betrayal of their, um, uh, their husband or their wife, okay? Uh, it's not a betrayal. Uh, instead, one goal is actually to bring uh, the abuser's sin to light so that they have an opportunity to, to turn back to God and as a result, turn away you know, from from whatever consequences as a result of that, of that sin that they are in, okay? Um, now, if the abuse decides to leave the abuser, uh, I think that that's where you help to utilize uh, and work through every resource that we have to help those who are abused. So, um, you know, we, we work actively in our faith at that point of time and accompany whatever help we can give them support with with whatever shelter or a job or, or whatever that, that may be required. OK, um, remember that it is important that especially when it comes to abuse, that you don't handle the situation on your own. You may need to get um, uh, uh, you need to identify and find other people who can work alongside with you, maybe um, other pastors, maybe a counselor, uh, maybe a, a, a lawyer, uh, or, uh, you know, maybe a medical professional, just to understand how how to work with them, okay? And of course, you pray with your counselee, um, uh, you know, it, uh, but continue to work through with them, okay? Now, what happens sometimes when people continue to remain in these abusive relationships? What should you do with spouses who want to stick back, okay? The first and foremost is not to condemn, not to shame them. Uh, the uh, So sometimes what we don't understand uh, is maybe the dynamics of seeking to uh, separate from an abuser it can actually be very, very complex, okay? Um, and leaving an abuser does not uh, necessarily mean that the abuse ends, right? Because domestic abuse does not end immediately with the separation, right? That there, there are many people who go through abuse even after separation. Um, there are different forms of abuse that happens. So while separation um, from the abuser is recommended, that is not always what sometimes an abuse, uh, uh, the abused may choose. So they may decide to stay in a relationship with an abuser. And you would imagine that that would require significant strength from within both spiritual as well as emotional strength. Okay, uh, they, they may feel they have an internal strength. Uh, okay, but this is the choice that they make. They, and it generally comes after an, uh, a self assessment in how, where they are at their at their relationship, okay? So at those points of time, uh, uh, you know, 
we we do give whatever support we can uh, at our end but it it finally uh, remains in the choice of the other person okay so abuse of any kind whether uh, especially physical abuse of any kind whether it's it's just pushing pulling all of that it's something that is that is uh, evil and we we need to be we need to condemn that behavior and it's uh, we know that it is entirely opposed to the way that god sees it and it, it definitely requires our support to be able to work through those are resources okay <coughs> excuse me now some of the questions that i think uh, i i just want to bring about is um you know that there are questions that sometimes ask do abusers change um now depending on the nature and the severity of the abuse there may be needed need to be a lengthy period of either no contact with the abuser or maybe some kind of a restricted co uh, uh, contact. Now, this what does it do? It allows family members to really work or or the or whoever is uh, involved, right? Maybe uh, a spouse, it may be children, it may be extended family, all of them to really heal and grow without the need or the pressure to having to interact with the with the abuser um, and the fear that a relapse could come about. Okay, um, it's important that um, you know the abuser. Like, if if you are working with with an abused and an abuser, to get the abuser to spend time enough to get help. Okay, and uh, that is generally demonstrated by their willingness and uh, by the progress that um, uh, that that maybe the spouse sees, right? So uh, again, here it is to, to um, maybe not living back together, but in like, like, a, like a going back to meeting or dating, uh, you know, what I, what I mean is uh, redating um, the person so that to really see how much has changed. So this, this again, um, this decision should not be made very early and uh, neither should be done in isolation. You know, you see one incident of um, uh, of good uh, uh, good relationship between them, and then you know, uh, quickly moving them back into it. I think it's important that um, a trusted trusted others also can help uh, the victims to see if uh, or the abused to see if there are any red flags and to know when trust or reconciliation is really premature or unwise. Okay. Uh, abusers sometimes, uh, okay, the, the fact is that there are certain traits of abusers um, that we need to notice, that they are particularly quite uh, adept at concealing their abusiveness when they want to. Okay. Uh, uh, so an abuser who has not really changed, who has not truly changed, how he thinks will often try or what, how he thinks, often what the way that he thinks is to reclaim the victim if he can and deceptively bring them back into uh, um, getting them back to the home. Okay, but unfortunately, when that happens, it typically brings about a worsening of the abuse because now you know the abuser is ticked off uh, from what what has been gone through. So, if you look at statistics, fundamentally, we see that abusers fundamentally changing are, are quite low um, it is because it's important for a, a victim to remember that you know when she feels uh, the 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 abuser abused uh, abused uh, kind of feels tempted to believe that everything is okay and they hang on to this hope then and they stay in that abusive relation okay now that that does not mean we are uh, I'm, I'm suggesting that they should not pray or trust god to intervene uh, in the way that he can, but also saying that you know God can only work with uh, in 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 a life of a person when the abuser allows him to. So uh, change definitely takes time, and because the ramifications of abuse are so devastating, we really need to see good demand uh, demand proof enough to see whether there has been a change before. Uh, any of this can be recommended back okay now the question again will come about is to see you know do you 
do you bring them to a place of reconciliation or no reconciliation? OK, so just to, um, uh, I think, regardless of how badly uh, people are treated in whatever relationship, we know, in, as, in, as it says in Ephesians 4.32, God expects us to forgive just as we have been forgiven by him. However, forgiving someone does not mean that you have to put yourself back in the way of harm. It does not mean you have to remain uh, uh, you know, in that kind of abusive relationship by living together with someone who's not repented, not changed their thinking, and not changed their, their, uh, their, their actions or their ways or, or their violent ways. Okay? So if an abusive, uh, abusing spouse gets the help he needs and is sufficiently transformed, and um, the, the pain, the hurt, the wounds of the abused, abused yeah, or of the spouse um, is is where, where they are able to let go and have come to a place of healing. Then yes, reconciliation is possible because that's what God does. Um, the wisdom of being reconciled after abuse, sh I, I think, should be considered on a case to base, ca case to case uh, basis with the proper counsel that it needs. Okay? Uh, um, a, a person does not have to reconcile with, uh, with the spouse uh, uh, if, if um, they choose not to, and if they feel that uh, you know, the extent and the damage has been, has been really great and, and have, have not seen any kind of a retribution from the other person, all right? OK, uh, just another understanding also is that domestic abuse is not a marriage problem. Okay, so marriage counseling is not the answer to uh, to a domestic abuse. Domestic abuse is the problem of uh, is is a problem of uh, if, um, primarily is the problem of the abuser. There can be cases where the marriage relationship is also uh, affected, and that is a separate thing. The, the excuse me the um, marriage uh, a marriage counseling does not come to bring down the abuse okay uh, and often what we see is a lot of uh, uh, those who are victims struggle with this truth because they are um, aware of their own weaknesses and flaws excuse me <clears throat> and uh, they, they sometimes are um, aware of their own weaknesses and the abuser often takes advantage of this uh, to blame the uh, abuse on the partners and often gets them to accept that <laughs> that there is get them to accept at least some part of the blame okay uh, just can you give me a minute Okay. Sorry, I'll just repeat that uh, point again. That um, generally those who are abused often um, um, are not aware of the fact that abuse can be an issue with. Uh, I mean, the abuse that's come is the issue is an issue with their spouse. And they feel that marriage in itself is not is uh, has become a problem, and that's why the abuse is happening. Mm. And they need to come to this truth that abuse is is an issue with the partner, and they need help. And as a, and after which is when marriage counseling can actually help in order to work through how to deal with um, with each other. Because what can happen is abusers sometimes will take advantage of this and they blame the abuse on the uh, other spouse, hoping that they would get, um, that they would accept some part of the blame. Okay, so um, 
sometimes when when we are not in touch with the realities of domestic abuse and the presentation of many abusers uh, it it they they are they they generally deceive all right and during and so what happens is during counseling sessions in which uh, 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 let's say the abuser is present in this case let's say if it's an abusive husband a wife may find it very difficult to really articulate or bring any clarity what she's experiencing so she may be quite intimidated particularly if uh, uh, you know if if a counselor is very sympathetic to the abuser's complaints about his wife and this often can add a lot more injury okay so individual counseling for the abu abuser uh, needs to be targeted at changing the abusive thinking and the behavior um, that is and that's what we see as a best course of action alongside with prayer with uh, with uh, spiritual upbuilding mm. only once you're able to see sincere and prolonged change in the abuser uh would marital counseling have any kind of a positive effect so in the meantime maybe the wife and the, and the children can benefit from receiving other kinds of support um, or uh, or help um, to build themselves up to restore the brokenness that's there <laughs> and uh, really help them to deal with that impact of that abuse okay um, so how can christian counseling help with domestic viol uh, abuse or violence uh, um so coping <clears throat> with and overcoming these effects of uh, domestic abuse is not like i said is not something that should be shouldered alone so just give me a minute <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. So I think we were looking at how uh, Christian counseling can help. So, um, uh, so those who've been abused uh, or who are exposed to uh, these kind of challenges, sometimes these issues may not surface until um, you know even after the abuse has ended. Uh, so, so some of these could be suppressed, deeply hidden, um, stays on for years till it uh, comes up in some way or in some other relationship or in some other stress. Okay. So if in case the abuse is still happening, uh, I think Christian counseling, what you do is helps you um, Help helps the person uh, revealing just by just by helping them reveal what is um, happening, what whatever has gone place in a confidential and supportive en environment, actually greatly enables them to sort out those conflicting desires or beliefs, um, faith related issues helps them to develop a plan of safety and also helps them to make um, important decisions. Now, in case the abuse is in the past, Christian counseling can help to connect whatever has happened back then and what they may be experiencing at this point of time. Emotional healing uh, is, is something that uh, healing and wholeness is something you can take them through <clears throat> and i know that you all are probably doing a course on in a whole this <laughs> excuse me on in a wholeness at this point right so there are some practical tools that you can discover in that 
in the context of uh, of our faith in Jesus, okay? and um, that's uh, that's how uh, we can work with those who may be physically going on undergoing any kind of physical violence. Okay, and I, I've taken an almost an hour in this, but I think it was uh, fairly important. Uh, any questions here? Any um, any questions? Any thoughts? Um, what if a person refuses to come out of a place of abuse, saying that, you know, God has joined us together, so no matter what happens, I want to cling on to this. So that's where I think uh, you open up the understanding that, uh, as I spoke about, you know, the biblical headship is not a place of... Um, uh, meeting out power and authority over over another individual, right? And um, maybe at that point of time, it's it's to help them see that uh, we are not referring to a separate to a divorce or a separation, long term separation, but it is to come to a place of safety. It is to bring them to a place of safety. Yes something that they also need to understand which a lot of those who are in abusive um, relationships they don't see is that a lot of times the abused spouse may be enabling the abusive uh, relationship of the of the other partner they may be enabling it in some way so in order to restore that to create a better flow of dynamics within that relationship <clears throat> a part of separation may be necessary till we can get the help and support so these are certain things that you can you you could do to make them understand or to or to change their form of thinking that uh, there is a certain expectation even in a in a marriage relationship of how a partner treats the other and that's what you would like to address with the abuser. Now that's as best as you can, <laughs> as best as you can do. The second thing that I, and let's say they, they still um, resort to going back, the next thing that I would do is uh, move them or convince them to open this up with somebody else, probably a family member or neighbor someone where they can get some kind of a support from because often abuse worsens in isolation when um, um, when there aren't people involved that's when abuse increases but when they know that people are involved people know abuse actually comes down and i've seen this very often that um, so even if it's just even if it's a counselor or even if it's a neighbor it's one family member, the knowledge that somebody else also knows brings down abuse. So that's something that you can push them into doing, is to uh, uh, share the information with somebody else so that there is you know, some kind of check that's done <laughs> or even surprise checks that can be done that catches people at the moment. So that in itself often can be a protective phase. But there could be, even in the midst of that, that's not available, that's not there. Um, then, yeah, you you probably can't do anything more than that. That's why a sense of uh, a network is always helpful, you know, whether it's a life group or a, um, or a, or a Bible study group or family, friends. All of this is helpful to keep some form of check on the abuse. I hope I answered your question, Pastor John. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. All right. Shall we stop for a break and we'll come back in 10 minutes at uh, 11 1. <laughs> 